The meaning and purpose of history, one of the most perplexing, nuanced, and indeed necessary questions to be asked, is seldom asked, and even more scarcely answered. For how absurd is it that a man can dedicate his life to examining every minute detail of the Battle of Waterloo, or to amassing statistics of Welsh migration to Argentina in the 19th century, without ever considering why he does this? What does it say that even some historians have never considered this question seriously? This would imply that the nature of history is so self-evident that all speculation on the topic would prove redundant. Or is it the opposite? History is in fact so vast, so intricate, and thus so daunting as to encompass the totality of human experience to the extent that some historians are sent scurrying like rodents into the ravines and crevices, taking comfort in the relative safety and indeed simplicity of their self-imposed confines. The origin of the word history, meaning inquiry, at once says everything and says nothing, for such inquiry precedes all knowledge. Yet it gives us a clue. Inquiry may not be the first obvious response to the question, what is history? Instead, one speaks of the past with a view to understanding it, if not simply recounting it. For what purpose? Herodotus would have us recount it for posterity. Indeed, remembrance, chronicling the deeds of our forebears and the deeds of ourselves, may serve some self-evident purpose, to credit our existences, if not glorify them. When we see the monuments and inscriptions of Assyrian kings and Egyptian pharaohs, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works ye mighty and despair, how could one not say that such things are testaments for posterity? Are historians then genealogists, propagandists, myth-makers? Myth-makers in the most literal sense, when one elevates Pharaoh to the level of Horus and claims that Julius Caesar was the descendant of Venus. In a sense, historians are a little of all of these things, and yet also represent their antithesis. For the origin of history as inquiry is to look at such testaments and mythic assertions and to ask how and why. History has ceased to entail simple remembrance, but requires investigation, corroborating evidence and witnesses. Thus, the advent of history would seem to herald the death of myth. With myth, there is simply a predetermined fact. With history, there is a question in pursuit of the fact. What would seem to be the obvious implication if the realm of history is the past and the purpose of history is to show the past as it really happened? But for all the seductive simplicity of showing the past as it really happened, in other words, a history in which the historian invites his reader to time travel, to arrive at something purely objective, we are still confounded by the sheer magnitude of the historical undertaking with all of its implications. Returning to Waterloo, is it possible to recount the progress of the battle? Surely. Indeed, this would be consistent with this notion of showing the past as it really happened, as Leopold von Ranke would have it, indeed coupling this with R. G. Collingwood's theory of history as reenacting the past. Let us take the coalition forces and the French forces, dress them up appropriately, plop down Wellington and Napoleon, and take us through the attack on Hougoumont, the charge of the Scots Greys, the arrival of the Prussians under Blücher, and the faltering of the Imperial Guard. Is this history? Or is it just spectacle? colour. Do we then focus on the thought processes of the supreme commanders of their respective armies, assess the tactical situation on the battlefield? But why should we feel so constrained in our inquiry? It is more important to assess the battle as a contained phenomenon, or ask why the battle is even taking place. Moreover, should we ask why the historian should care that this battle took place, and what is his particular interest in it. That question in and of itself implies that the historian has some influence over determining the history rather than merely guiding us through it 
Indeed he does. This particular historian has asked the question, why did Napoleon lose the Battle of Waterloo? He has judged both Napoleon and Waterloo to be of historic significance. How and why was the victor of the battles of Marengo, Austerlitz and Jena defeated in this instance? His interest, as you can see, is strictly focused on Napoleon's martial reputation. Another historian expresses interest in the subject of Napoleon's defeat purely from the political view of the ultimate fall of the First French Empire. Another has little interest in Napoleon at all and is focused on the historic development and role of battlefield artillery. A Belgian historian has approached this topic from the perspective of the forces of the United Kingdom of the Netherlands allied to the British. Finally, there is even a local historian whose focus is on the battle in relation to the town of Waterloo. If one is to establish Waterloo as a historical event, it is not predetermined, but must be justified. Indeed, as has been shown, it can be justified in a variety of ways predicated on question that the historian has set out to answer. History is not prepackaged, ready to be unwrapped. The historian is a theologian of the past, in that he must provide a hermeneutic framework for his chosen topic. But moreover, the historian goes above and beyond a mere theologian of the past, in that he determines scripture by justifying the significance of his chosen topic, in addition to serving the role as the topic's interpreter. The notion that a historian can let the fact speak for themselves, as if history can be democratised so, becomes so absurd when one considers that the historian selects his facts. Whatever his purpose, the historian possesses his history to some degree. Here the lines between non-fiction and fiction become blurred. A famous aphorism goes that the poet sins if he does not invent, the historian sins if he does. And yet invention is the essence of history, because history is ontology and it is praxis. History requires ordering and categorization, and it is human action that is being ordered and categorized. What is the early modern period but pure invention? Did an Englishman living during the reign of Elizabeth I ever suspect that he was of the early modern period? Did any inhabitant of Constantinople during the 11th century believe that he or she belonged to a Byzantine Empire, a term invented by a German historian after 1453, the final fall of Constantinople? In a similar vein, why would a historian of France begin his history in 1789 and finish in 1815? Perhaps because, thematically, a history of that period forms the basis of a compelling narrative if the goal is to recreate the past, is it enough that a historian relies on statistical data and lists of dates, leaving the reader potentially disengaged, or is it required of the historian to possess a sense of aesthetics, a literary flourish that can enthrall as much as inform? If both are required, which is more important? History is fundamentally a creative and a scientific exercise. Its value should be self-evident for its capacity for invention, is boundless, and so is the scope of potential inquiry. Curiosity is the province of the historian, and all human experience exists in history. However, the historian has freedom, but he has no license whatsoever, for history is still a science with knowledge as its object. Yet, it is a very particular science. Like history, Science begins with a question, a question that is answered through repeated experimentation and subject to a rigorous process of falsification. Here, one can dredge out a tired cliché that those who ignore the mistakes of the past are bound to repeat them. In this respect, the role of the historian is far more complicated than that of the natural scientist, for despite the cliché, no two historical events are the same. History cannot be repeated, for history is not a closed experiment occurring within the necessary controlled environment. Every event, every historical subject, is unique, and the parallels that one can draw are prima facie obscure. This is because it is not enough to say that history is the science of human action. Rather, history 
is the study of man, subject to time, as his liege. Man exists as slave and time as master. Man is the inheritor of time, and time will in turn destroy him. Every historian invents history and is at once conditioned by history. What is history, then, than the purest expression of change? Even historians such as those of the Annals School, who rebuke the notion of a history of events, cannot resist history as an expression of change. More than change, it is a process of becoming. Returning to this as a process of reenactment, one quickly understands that one is subject to time, pure reenactment is impossible, and the meaning of history is found in the pursuit. It will then dawn that the expectations of history are impossible. As Vico discovered, in order to understand the process of becoming that was the foundation of the Roman Republic, it was necessary to become versed in the language, in this instance Latin, in the customs, in this instance Roman law, in religion, in this instance Roman polytheism. Coupled to this, one had to embrace a certain historical sympathy. One has to crack open the head of an early Roman and view the world as he would have seen it, without trace of the historian's prejudice or taint of presentism. By presentism, I mean the prejudices of the age of the, histori of the historian that he finds himself in. Whether the historian accepts or rejects those prejudices, he is still conditioned by them. The process of studying history is a progression towards entropy. Coupled to these demands, every historian, whether consciously or not, is a historian of the particular and a historian of all. For as we understand that no historical event occurs twice, no historical event occurs in a vacuum either. What if one goes to the effort of learning ancient Attic Greek, studying the various polities and personalities of Greece in the early 5th century BC, and wishes to embark on a study of, Greco of the Greco-Persian Wars, only to later discover that one has made no effort to appraise the conflict from the perspective of the Persians. It is fallacious to presume that, as with the absurd notion of pre-packaged historical events, that they have become pre-packaged categories of historical groupings. The strict national history is the most common trap to fall into, which should be surprising, as history in the modern sense is the inheritance of Greece and a burgeoning Greek consciousness at the time of the Greco-Persian Wars. Such a limited view only expanded with the conquest of Alexander the Great, when in a sense Greece became the world, only then quickly to contract when Livy understood history in terms of the glory of Rome. Categories of the historian's particular focus can range from the life of a single individual. It must be noted that a very limited conception of biography, meaning study of a life, divorced from context, is seldom attributed as history. I fundamentally disagree. A human life, a sentient life, differs from a biological organism in the sense that a human being is a child of history, aware of history, conditioned by history, and thus a part of history. Individuals, moreover, are either direct participants and even drivers of historical events, or offer us historical perspective. Thus, categories can range from the individual to a region across a decade, to a nation across a century, to human civilization at all times. The rebellion against this notion of the historian of the particular and the historian of all is the Schillerian dry as dust, the historian, or perhaps more appropriately, the antiquarian, that being a compiler rather than interpreter of the facts, who takes pride in knowing more and more about less and less, the extreme position taken in reaction to this absolute prohibition on license, that the historian must show due fidelity to his sources. What is even more ironic is that the dry as dust phenomena is increasing, while our categories of time and space in the modern age have been radically redefined by technology demonstrating a previously unknown level of global connectivity and historical interaction, where once distances had proven insurmountable for historical interaction. Beyond the demands placed upon the historian is the historian's tragedy. The historian knows that an absolute history does not exist, and thus anticipates that, a creature, that as a creature of history, 
his history will be relegated to a mere facet of his age for future historians to revise, supersede, and at worst, ignore. For histories exist in time, and thus reflect the fleeting fashions of that time. Perhaps the most extreme iteration of this position comes from E. H. Carr's conception of history as an unending, multi-generational dialogue. For better or worse, it is ironic that the historian's tragedy has become an institutional feature of academic history, and an insidious one at that. The historian understands that his history represents a form of planned obsolescence, in the hope that a new generation of historians will have access to new archival sources and the like, that have the potential to completely recontextualise our understanding of historical phenomena. This notion, however, is inherently progressive, that historians can only improve upon existing precedents, and that history can exist in a harmonious and evolving consensus, to the extent that the historian is liable to forget that he, as a creature of history, is conditioned by the prejudices of his age, along with all of his colleagues. A progressive concept of historiography, of writing history, betrays a progressive current running through our understanding of history itself. The implication is that not only is man a slave to time, but that time itself has an agenda. This deification of time is the inheritance and perversion of Christianity. Christianity, which perceives the presence of God in all things and stands in anticipation of the new millennium and the second coming of Christ. With the fall of Christianity, the passage of time itself is symptomatic of progress, progress which is an inevitable manifestation of the passage of time, though progress here is meant as the improvement of humanity, a secular form of man's salvation. Thus, history in the hands of a Comte or a Marx becomes the agent of political upheaval. In the case of Marx, down to specific and prophetic categories of economically succeeding systems. The deification of the historical process, rather appropriately, can be adequately understood as a historical effect, while the philosopher of history can attribute this corruption of the discipline as theology, and not history at all. History is in essence humanistic, and not in a moral sense. All conceptions of things which are metaphysical are understood in the context of time and space in history. The historian cannot answer whether miracles exist or whether eternal salvation is only possible through the Catholic Church. He can only answer, for example, that it was believed by the majority of Spaniards in the 17th century that miracles existed and that eternal salvation was only possible through the Catholic Church. Rather, the legacy of historical sympathy, of sublimating oneself to one's chosen place and period, is that of an extreme moral relativism. It doesn't matter what the historian believes, only what the subject of, subjects of his inquiry believed. Moreover, he would be better suited to convert to Catholicism and learn Spanish should he wish to cultivate an appropriate sympathy and understanding for the Spaniards of the 17th century. The same logic would exist for Islam and the study of the Abbasid Caliphate. In appreciating a comparative study of various religions and language groups, the relativistic mindset tends towards an absolute perennialism. History, as fundamentally humanistic and temporal, cannot aspire to objective understanding of the absolute and the eternal. Thus, a clear distinction exists between history and theology and various subdisciplines of philosophy such as logic, as history, by contrast, is focused on a subjective understanding of a historical actor or group, which in turn is subject to the subjective understanding of the historian and he by future historians. Logic, epistemology and theology, etc., can inform us of our reading of history. So what meaning can we draw from history? There are, as I see them, three categories of meaning, the precedent, the parable, and the poetic. The precedent is the closest that the historical process has in approaching the replicatability of results in the natural sciences. But as with legal precedents, every historical precedent is circumstantial. While the historian can take the precedent, understand it in minute and glorious detail, 
and indicate well-argued and justified parallels with other long-dead or even evolving situations. Historians may be endowed with predictive powers, but shall never be prophets. Given the relativistic nature of historical inquiry, the parable is nebulous, contingent on the perspective of the individual historian. Indeed, it is with the parable that history is at its most corruptible, history becoming diffused, often erroneously, into national memory, political culture, and apologetics in general. History can become a raison d'etre, a moral justification for action. The poetic is the most elusive, for the poetic seeks out eternal truths which aren't historically contingent. In other words, the poetic is an archetype emanating from history in this case, yet rising above it, shedding all historicist trappings into the world of pure abstraction, being qua being. This represents the triumph of the ontological category in the study of history. While historical categories and replicated concepts as representing eternal truths are seductive, history is not a world of abstraction. History is praxis, it is the application of a concept, not the justification of a concept, which would serve as eupraxia, or conversely, dyspraxia. Though history is found in the pursuit and not the absolute, the pursuit of history is the pursuit of life, and thus of an incontestable value. In history, there are no predetermined subjects, nor shackling constructs or systems of analysis. History tends to infinite creativity as an art form, yet with all the precisions of a science. Before history, one is an eternal catechumen, cognizant of the scale of his ignorance, yet in some way ennobled by it. The scale and complexity, indeed the struggle of history, is its essence and its greatest asset.